do you ever think of the second? In a simple line of succession, we tend to think of something being first in any sort of context as being more important and deserving of more recognition than whatever comes afterward. I mean, why would you? It's basically human nature to give who or whatever is first the utmost importance. The sports team who came first always gets the biggest trophy at the end of the season. The person who invents something revolutionary always has the most control right off the bat. I bet y'all could easily answer who the first person to walk on the moon was, or who flew the first airplane. These are the ones who we know at a mere instant, the ones whose names will forever be written in the history books, the ones who will always be remembered as the first. With all due respect, all others just seem like copycats in the natural line of succession. And you know, it's kind of sad. Sure, we should always admire who or what came first, but that means we automatically skip over the interesting stories of the people and entities who had the tragic disadvantage of simply being second. Just because something has the bragging rights for being first doesn't mean it is always better. In fact, sometimes it can be just the opposite. It's such a common phenomenon that you can see it in something as trivial as a show about a yellow sea sponge. This is a video about the next in succession. A video about an idea, conception, memories, myths, and discrepancies. Yet most importantly, this is about the second episode of SpongeBob SquarePants Reef Blower. And this is Second Chance. I'll cut the fluff. You all know Spongebob. If that name doesn't strike a chord to you, you've probably been living under a rock. Insert Patrick Star joke here. He lives in a pineapple under the sea, has got some friends in his hometown of Bikini Bottom, works at the Krusty Krab, that guy, that show. He's the face of one of the most popular properties of our generation. A true brand that has substantially grown from its roots as just another wacky Nickelodeon show. It can be hard to believe Barry under all of those Spongebob television sets, gummy Krabby Patties, movies, and spin-offs lies not only a successful Nickelodeon TV series, but most importantly, an idea in the mind of one man. While SpongeBob SquarePants might be one of the most well-known franchises of all time, its origin story may be just as iconic. <laughs> Series creator and marine biologist Steven Hillenburg created a simple sea-themed comic book called The Inner Tidal Zone in 1989. Wanting to combine his interests in both marine life and art, Hillenberg's aim for the book was to teach kids all about the wonderful life in the sea. While it ultimately went unpublished, the inner tidal zone was the basis for many of the ideas that Spongebob would be created on, including a curiously named main character we called Bob the Sponge. Later, while working on the Nickelodeon show Rocco's Modern Life, Hillenberg would meet one of the series' writers, Martin Olsen, who saw his little comic and encouraged him to transform it into a show that could be pitched to Nickelodeon. The show was successfully pitched to Nick with an underwater aquarium, a pitch bible to lay out the central theme of the show was created, and in 1997, the pilot episode of Spongebob Squarepants was drafted up to finally get food on the table for those hungry Nickelodeon executives. We'll get back to this pilot later when the show actually premieres. All you need to know now is that it's called Help Wanted and it functions as the perfect anti-hero to our story. Now, I know you're probably in a daze with all these twists and turns, so I'll give you a short summary. Funny sponge show, pitch bible drafted, pilot created, higher ups pleased. Got it? Good. But let's take a step back for a moment and take a look at the true beginning of this expansive tale. Because without this crucial first piece of the puzzle, this video very well may not exist. This is the Spongebob Pitch Bible. For those of you wondering, a pitch bible is a tightly packed book created during a show's development to give detailed info about the characters, story, and other concepts. In SpongeBob's pitch bible is loaded to the brim, 56 pages with nothing but detailed outlines of the show itself, character descriptions, concept art, and important to the purposes of our tale, storylines for potential episodes. Starting on page 36, several plots, stories, and ideas are laid out as contenders to be fleshed out into full episodes of SpongeBob. Alas, many of these storylines would, in fact, be later fleshed out into iconic season 1 episodes that diehard SpongeBob fanatics all know and love. Episodes such as Jellyfishing, Squeaky Boots, Bubble Stand, Employee of the Month, and even my personal favorite of the show, Pizza Delivery, all got their starts as a little page in the Pitch Bible. 
I can go on and on all day about this incredible messiah book of endless knowledge, but we need to specifically focus on page 41. On this seemingly minuscule page of this vast pitch bible starts our true journey into a seemingly minuscule episode of Spongebob Squarepants. Are you ready kids? Because this is Reef Blower. Or, um, Reef Blowers as it was originally known. A Spongeboy premise, back when the show was actually called Spongeboy Ahoy, written by series writer Tim Hill and showrunner Steven Hillenberg. The episode would start with Spongeboy and Patrick going outside with their brand spanking new Reef Blowers. Reef Blower-like devices that are worn like backpacks and only sometimes are used as weapons of mass destruction. Squidward, who is tending to some morning gardening, is raking up some clamshells in his front yard. The two characters propel themselves across their yards with the reef blowers, but end up creating a massive sand explosion that covers poor Squidward and his house. Then, get this, Squidward just straight up pops his Easter Island head out of the ground like a cork and runs off into the sun with it, finding a faraway hill to place his house on. Spongeboy and Patrick, worried about Squidward's well-being, try to figure out why Squidward is so mad at them. And then, Spongeboy has a stroke of genius. The reason why Squidward is so mad at us is that we never offered to clean his yard up with the reef blowers after we messed it up. So overnight, our two main characters finally clean up all of the debris in front of Squidward's house, but end up eroding the very hill holding his house up. Morning arrives, and Squidward wakes up only to realize that his house rolled back down into the spot between Spongeboy and Patrick's humble abodes. Squidward is then giving his own reef blowers a present, only to rocket himself into the stratosphere and smack dab into the hole of some random boat as the episode fades to black. A fate worse than death. Now, I know what you're thinking. Bray Bray, that sounds nothing like the reef blower I know. Don't worry, you aren't dreaming. Aside from surrounding the reef blower device itself, this early iteration shares very little in common with what would eventually hit the sea waves. No Squidward pulling his house out of the ground and moving to some random hill, no Spongebob ukulele, and certainly no Squidward boat incident of 97. None of this would carry over to the final episode. If you've seen Reef Blower before, it's fairly obvious why this is, but we'll cross that hill when we slap our Easter Island head into it. For now, let's savor this very first foundational step towards the effervescent future of Spongebob Squarepants, all stemming from one little summary in the book of Spongy Wonder. With Hillenberg's little show impressing Nick's executives left and right, it was no wonder that they would give him funding and two weeks to develop and write a pilot with his team. In the summer of 97, the team would get to work on creating the pilot for Spongeboy Ahoy, Help Wanted. I told you we would get back to this. The episode will revolve around Spongeboy being determined to get a job at the finest fast food establishment in the city, the Krusty Krab. At first, his future employees Mr. Krabs and Squidward are skeptical of the yellow sponge, sending him on the near impossible task of getting an elusive hydrodynamic spatula just to get him off their skin. However, a massive crowd of wild anchovies comes in and the two Krusty Krab employees are scared for their lives. But in comes Spongeboy, hydrodynamic spatula in hand to save the day. Impressed by his skills, he's hired right on the spot. The pieces were surely falling into place by now. Help Wanted would be a perfectly crafted introduction to the undersea world of Bikini Bottom. While some pilots are generally made behind closed doors only for the watchful eyes of executives without any intent of actually airing them, Spongeboy's pilot was always meant to be our introduction, the very first episode we would see on our television screens everywhere. Aside from having to change the titular character's name from Spongeboy to Spongebob Squarepants due to conflicting trademarks with a mop product, everything seemed to be smooth sailing going forward. But there was a problem. In most animated shows like Spongebob Squarepants, a typical full episode needs to clock in at around 22 minutes. No more, no less. This time frame is enforced to not only fill up its allocated time slot, but also allow space for at least two commercial breaks. In the case of most episodes aside from full-length specials and other special cases, this is usually done by bundling two 11-minute segments together, which if you do the math right, should exactly add up to 22 minutes. The problem here is that Help Wanted only clocks in at a measly 8 minutes and 16 seconds. What is going to fill up those 2 minutes and 44 seconds until the second segment starts? 
Luckily, the SpongeBob crew had an ace up their sleeve, and once they got the green light for producing episodes, they got to work on a little episode we like to call Reef Blower. It's only fair for this little pilot extension, as it was fittingly known during production, that the SpongeBob crew would take the pitch bible for key inspiration. They likely saw Reef Blower as an idea not necessarily worthy of an entire segment, at least early on where we still didn't know who half the main cast is, but still something to keep around just in case. Well, even here, just one episode into production, that case has seemed to come into play. You know that feeling? That feeling where something seemingly so insignificant gets a story like an, on the surface, more significant counterpart. Reef Blower is that feeling personified into the history of mass media. It was never meant to be big, or good even, it was just something that needed to exist. The sequel to the magnum opus of one of television's greatest gifts of the 21st century, the continuation of a global icon known from sea to shining sea, was, by design, born out of necessity. But I guess that's just most seconds. Whether they are born out of compassion, or in this case, born to fill airwaves until we all move on to the next thing, they share one trait in common. They are born to continue. This is a legacy that Reef Blur would share both before and after its grand premiere. Oh yeah, right. We jump to May 1st, 1999, a special day in Nickelodeon history. Not only would the 12th annual Kids' Choice Awards be held live at 8pm EST, but it was wedged right in the middle of two new premieres, like one grandly delicious Oreo cookie. At 7.30pm, a new episode of Rugrats, cool enough but not necessarily must-see television, but at 9.30 is where things got really interesting. Right after the KCAs, Nickelodeon was about to pull out their latest, greatest, and newest sponge on the block. On that day, at that time, SpongeBob SquarePants would premiere to an audience immigrating from the KCAs of more than 3 million people. Truly the start of a franchise. People's first glance at SpongeBob would of course come in the form of the pilot, Help Wanted. You know, the pilot to end all pilots, the introduction to Bikini Bottom, blah blah, you get the point, we went over this earlier. It's fair to infer that this is when viewership started to drop off a cliff for Nick. Sure, it may have not been a school night, but I want you to picture yourself being a kid on May 1st of 99, 9.38pm. Unless you're really, really into this new Spongebob show that Nick had been showing in the previews as of late, chances are you didn't really care all that much. The main course of this fine meal was over, Spongebob was just dessert. Don't get me wrong, I love dessert, but Help Wanted was all you could really stomach. Chances are you just changed the channel to baseball or something, or maybe you had a really strict bedtime and needed to go to sleep. Few people cared about Reef Blower then, and still, few people seem to care much about Reef Blower now. Contrary to popular belief, SpongeBob SquarePants wasn't exactly the instant flip of the switch success right off the bat. It would take a few years for the show to really find its footing. So, for those who stuck around to see Reef Blower, what exactly would you get? If you are already familiar with this episode, don't worry, because I will be putting some alternate entertainment on the side so you don't die of boredom. Ready? Let's do this. The episode starts with Squidward, annoyed as usual, kicking a shell into the yard of one SpongeBob SquarePants. SpongeBob, spotting the shell, literally slides into his garage to get out his reef blower, which as I explained earlier, is a device similar to a leaf blower. Squidward gets angry at all the racket, but SpongeBob tries so hard to blow the shell out of his yard that he ends up blowing a bunch of sand right back into Squidward's face. He quickly acts, shifting all of the sand off of Squidward in his precious piece of seaweed question mark, and right back onto his own yard. He ends up sucking all of the sand into the device, and kinda just breaks it in the process. Using the power of stupid cartoon logic, he tries to fix the reef blower, ends up getting so mad that he pulls the string into a four-way intersection, oh hi Incidental 3 and Fred, you're new here, and slingshots himself back into the reef blower. This works so well that he then has the power to suck up the entire ocean, with the water pressure ending up making the whole ocean go kablooey out of the reef blower. While Spongebob casually goes back into his pineapple as if nothing ever happened, Squidward is stuck in a pile of sand, only for the shell that started this whole conflict to float back down onto his nose as the episode fades to black. Again, a fate worse than death. I know you all have a few things on your mind, now that we were able to see the finished product, and trust me, I'll try to get to them. Maybe you're new to the world of Reef Blower and new Spongebob Squarepants as more of a brand? 
Maybe you just need a little refresher on the lore behind this episode and clicked on this video because woohoo, algorithm, or something like that. Maybe you're a reef blower expert, just bored to death at all of this surface level knowledge for one of Spongebob's strangest adventures. Whatever your case may be, there's plenty of things to be said about this little second wonder of an episode. Remember when we were talking about the Pitch Bible earlier and how I said that this episode would turn into something almost completely different in the final product? Well, here we are, and aside from the episode revolving around the reef floor device, it shares almost nothing in common. This is more likely a result of the episode having to be cut down into a shorter format, if anything. The pitch version definitely has more elaborate world building and hijinks fit for an 11 minute segment. Squidward moving his house, Spongebob and Patrick pulling tricks to get Squidward to move back home, then they clean up his yard with the blower, you get the picture. In contrast, the two minutes we got played up a more simple conflict between the two characters. Spongebob plays tricks and treats with the reef blower, with Squidward often being either annoyed as usual or directly being at the receiving end of this tomfoolery, but it isn't inherently complex in structure or plot. Certainly, it isn't as complex as was previously envisioned. But there's something else intriguing about Reef Blower, something that taints even the slightest of any conversation about this episode, something that gives this segment a unique legacy that no other SpongeBob episode can share. Where's the dialogue? It's a question SpongeBob fans, media enthusiasts, and even. <gasps> Lost media searchers have been asking for the more than two decades after Reef Blower's premiere. You thought this was a silly video essay on some SpongeBob SquarePants episode from 23 years ago? All this babbermouthing, storytelling, and world building was all just a little ploy by me to make just one more lost media video after all. You've been tricked, bamboozled, even trapped in this little fantasy world I've created, held hostage by the nozzle of SpongeBob's reef blower. You can't escape it. I can't escape it. We're all bound by two little words, one lost and one media for the rest of our lonely days on this planet. Now where were we? This does make way for an interesting chapter in Reef Blower's history as we've inched ever so farther from that grand day in 1999. Again, I'll cut the fluff. If you didn't already notice, Reef Blower remains to this day the only segment in SpongeBob SquarePants history to have absolutely zero dialogue. That's right, aside from a single silent you spoken by SpongeBob, a net zero words spoken by a character come through the speakers of our television sets. This little episode stands tall in the sea of other popular Spongebob segments for this very reason. But unlike Band Geeks, or Chocolate with Nuts, or Pizza Delivery, or any of the dozens of other Spongebob episodes that have cemented themselves in internet culture, Reef Blower is popular for a different reason. The reason of mystery and discrepancy. Reef Blower's curious lack of dialogue made it less of an actual talking point, and more of a point of contention. Was Reef Blower supposed to have dialogue in the first place? With the birth of conspiracy theories, unsourced info, and the illusion of fact, as the internet grew and thus so did this episode's legendary status, most online discussions seemed to point in the direction of a yes. To show you how this is put into play, here are a few examples of Reef Blower being brought up in the context of its dialogue. The episode was originally going to have dialogue, but the recording equipment broke and the episode was rewritten to be silent. Today I learned one of the first episodes of Spongebob Squarepants named Reef Blower was originally going to have dialogue, but was rewritten to have none because the recording equipment broke. Reef Blower is one of the most intriguing Spongebob episodes. It's been said that the reason why the episode had no dialogue was because the audio equipment was broken. The entire story had to be rewritten. In the Spongebob episode Reef Blower, the episode is silent, but it wasn't originally supposed to be that way. The episode originally had audio, but something happened along the way with the audio track. So the people who worked on the episode just decided to make it silent. So what I'm curious about is if any audio from the episode actually exists somewhere. It may not be a big chance that it exists, but it's still worth a chance to see if it's out there somewhere. Fantastic spelling and grammar, by the way, just mm, 10 out of 10. Oh yeah, here it is in a video about SpongeBob deleted scenes. Reef Blower. Probably one of the more famous examples on this list. The episode Reef Blower, which is a completely silent episode of the series, meaning it has no dialogue, was originally supposed to contain dialogue, but the audio recording equipment was damaged, and the writers decided to rewrite the episode into its current form to get around the setback. 
It is unknown if any dialogue was recorded for this episode before the audio equipment was damaged. All of these little internet conversation kickstarters were based on the same base idea. That Reefblower was originally going to have dialogue, but the audio recording equipment broke and they had to rewrite the episode into its current form to accommodate. And honestly, I don't necessarily blame these people for spreading it around to the point of it almost being an accepted fact. If you've kept up with all of the history we've mentioned thus far, yeah, it does seem quite intriguing how much changed between the Pitch Bible and the actual segment. Something had to have taken place to allow the need for drastic changes to the storyline and direction of Reefblower, and considering that there's no dialogue either, it all has to start there, right? As much as I would like to believe that there's some alternate timeline with some treasured dialogue track from Reefblower sitting in the Nickelodeon archive just begging to be found, that, unfortunately, just isn't the case. All those discrepancies about the dialogue equipment breaking and all of those unsourced inferences about the episode being rewritten are just that, discrepancies, and nothing more. But where could this statement of mistruth have ever originated in the first place? Ah yes, IMDB, the ultimate internet hellhole of unsourced information. Much like wiki articles and the like, IMDB operates on a system of publicly edible pages of general information. Also like wiki articles is the sheer amount of unsourced, theorized, misinterpretive, and straight up untrue information about our favorite pieces of media. And no stranger to this is our good friend Reefblower, which, while not on the actual page anymore luckily, is the birth of one of the biggest discrepancies in the history of modern media. To confirm this, I went back a few years on the Wayback Machine, and just like that, I found exactly what I was looking for. Reefblower was meant to have dialogue, just like the other episodes. Unfortunately, the studio had bad sound equipment at the time, so they decided to make the episode dialogue-free. However, Roger Bumpus did record Squidward's growling and gasping sounds. That last part is an, uh, interesting statement, but at least we've found our culprit. One nasty, untrue culprit. While Reefblower may have lived a recent life of conspiracy and discrepancy, if nothing else, it makes for an interesting story. It's the textbook example of how we should always look closer at the seconds of the world. Maybe I'm getting ahead of myself here, but I think there's one last thing I need to answer to cap off the story of Reefblower once and for all. If breaking dialogue equipment didn't create the Reefblower we all know and love, what did? The truth is that we didn't know. There really was no clearly sourced answer in sight, not by any Spongebob crew members, not on any commentary track on a Spongebob DVD, and certainly not anywhere online. Years would roll by, decades would roll by. As the intrigue surrounding Reefblower grew, still, no one was coming out of the shadows and giving us curious detectives the answer we all desperately needed. It's only fitting that people started to jump to their own conclusions, so much so that the internet clinged onto them as truth, when in reality, these were far, far from it. But then, a glimmer of hope. So, do you know who Jay Lender is? <laughs> A longtime storyboarder, director, and writer on SpongeBob SquarePants, he would probably know better than anybody what's going on in the inner workings of our favorite episodes. On a seemingly unrelated tweet about an unproduced Halloween SpongeBob episode from June 9th, 2022, a fan asks Jay if there's any truth in the equipment breaking during production. The answer he gave us was incredible, and put all the rumors in the grave once and for all. False. My understanding at the time was this. Reefblowers was made to extend Help Wanted to a full half show, but since they were separate productions, Screen Actors Guild rules mandated paying the actors a second set of session fees. That was around 2500 bucks total back then. So, silence! An anticlimactic answer for sure, but I don't know what we were expecting. Because over everything else, it was the one us Spongebob enthusiasts desperately needed. After all of the rumors and inferences, it all came down to this. It wasn't broken equipment, the lack of dialogue was just a way to get out of paying big fat voice actor fees. And for a tweet that literally ended with silence, this surely had the capacity to send shockwaves out from it. CBR.com would eventually publish the findings on this whole situation, citing Jay's tweet as well as this episode's storyboards, which don't reference any dialogue either. As stated at the end of the article, and thus the fitting end of this story, the legend is false. Do you ever think of the second? In a simple line of succession, we should, in fact, think of the second. We've been doing it this entire video. 
Reefbuller takes this ideology to 10, giving us a textbook example of a story beating the odds. I could have easily made this video about Help Wanted, or just the history of Spongebob full stop, and you still would have probably enjoyed it. But I didn't. I chose Reef Blower, a seemingly unflattering episode where the only reason it exists is to fill up space until the next segment starts. All odds would seem to point against it, after all filler does get a negative connotation in most cases, but it overcame it all. Reef Blower's a spectacle, a time filler, a story, a dream, a conspiracy, and an unsourced factoid plaguing the internet. It's also a pretty fun episode of a pretty fun show. Reef Blower is many things, but most importantly, it's the second episode of the hit television series Spongebob Squarepants. The second in a long dynasty of adventures, and somehow, someway, against all logic, the world gave it a glorified leaf blower to propel itself into the sunset with. That's why we're here covering it 23 years later. That's why the discrepancies only made it more valuable to us. And that's why Reef Blower is deserving of a second chance. On May 1st, 1999, Spongebob Squarepants and in turn Reef Blower premiered on Nickelodeon and would change the world forever. On that same exact day, the body of famous mountaineer George Mallory was found on the banks of Mount Everest, who went mysteriously missing on the 1924 expedition of the mountain. This is also a turning point in the hit Emperor Lemon video, The Everest Discrepancy, of which this video's title is fashionably inspired by. Maybe this is just some wild coincidence. Maybe it was meant to be this way. Whatever the case may be, whether you're getting towards the highest point on Earth or way down in the bottom of the sea playing with a reef blower, I guess everything has to come back down and around to make the world discover once again, no matter the circumstances. This has been Bray Bray, thanks for watching, and remember that Buff Yoshi is forever supreme.